UK citizens are perfectly capable of feeling very strongly that the UK is doing the right thing by helping Ukraine to win this war. For us, for the UK, the important thing alongside uh, sanctions is justice. You do see that Ukraine doesn't make front page news. Uh, Does not. As regularly as it used to. Everyone understands that should Ukraine not prevail, the threat is not just going to stay with Ukraine. But there is no reason again why a future Prime Minister shouldn't equally have that close friendship with Ukraine. The UK was not saying this is going to end in two or three days. The biggest risk was that this was going to become a long, grinding war of attrition. And here we are. So as a minimum, I would say that you go back to the pre-February 24th where you were before. On the reform side, uh, I actually have been quite inspired. The United Kingdom is actually the flagship country amongst the uh, Western European nations in supporting Ukraine in different spheres. Why did it happen? Why is this UK, not, not France, not Germany, not someone else? And what is the personal role of the Prime Minister Johnson in this sphere? What is his, how did his personal attitude to Ukraine influence this situation? Well, so first of all, I can't comment on the policies of France, Germany or other countries. They have made their own decisions and their own postures. But for the UK, it was uh, immediately apparent when uh, we saw the troop build up as we did. And as you know, the UK and the US were making that clear and making that public that uh, this was going to happen. And equally clear that Ukrainians were going to fight this invasion. This invasion was going to be an illegal attack on Ukraine's sovereignty and on their democracy. And these are two values that the UK holds very dear, represent us actually, represent the world that we all want to be in. So when the Prime Minister was briefed on that and we had our conversations about that, it was clear what we were going to do. We are allies of Ukraine, we are partners and friends of Ukraine, and we were going to support Ukraine to push this invasion back. And that policy has been consistent and clear since before the invasion and all the way through invasion it's held strong and it will hold strong no matter who takes over from Boris Johnson. As for um, his personal involvement, I mean, I do think that the Prime Minister uh, feels it uh, as uh, emotionally as he does politically. And uh, he has been a strong friend to uh, Ukraine. But there is no reason, again, why a future Prime Minister shouldn't equally have that close friendship with Ukraine, the, I think the most extraordinary thing for me as an ambassador is that in this crisis, although it's represented, of course, by the Prime Minister and his engagement, so many of our cabinet ministers have developed friendships and strong relationships with Ukrainian cabinet ministers, so many of whom are responsible for managing and responding to this invasion. So I feel quite confident that that friendship will endure. So, uh uh, nothing can change this fall after when some any new prime minister t takes office because many Ukrainians are quite worried about this because they do know Boris Johnson and they do not know so much maybe someone who can take this office this fall. Well, I mean, lots will change because lots of people will have new jobs um, in the cabinet. So, of course, new friendships need to emerge from that. But I think the point is the policy stays strong all ministers, all officials, I, we are all, uh, we all have a depth of understanding of that policy. So whoever takes those jobs will know that part of their role is to further develop the friendships that were, um, began if they're with, by their predecessors, if those predecessors move on. As for the military support of Ukraine, what uh, should we expect or wait for in some foreseeable future? Also, I'm not going to comment on future um, defence support, not least because for security reasons, I think it's important that we don't. But I suppose what I can say is the way in which the UK has helped Ukraine militarily has always come, consistently come, from conversations, military to military, conversations between our two defence ministers, who, by the way, also have a very good and very close relationship, where we, have, uh, we develop our understanding of what Ukraine needs. And then we provide according to what Ukraine needs at various tactical stages of this, uh, of this invasion. So each time we have sent kit, it has been as a result of those consultations. And as we continue to send capability, and not just us, but as we continue to have conversations with other defence ministers and other countries, because of course this must be a collective effort, it is always informed by Ukrainian assessment that we then discuss with them. In your opinion, 
in general, uh, does the West help Ukraine enough, as much as it needs, as much as we need, actually? I think one of the most extraordinary things that have come about as a result of this invasion has been the unity of purpose mm -hmm. among countries in Europe and beyond Europe, of course the US, um, but other countries too, in their intent to come together because they all see this assault on sovereignty, they all see this assault on uh, democracy. So this is an extraordinary platform to build on. The challenge for everybody is that this is not going to be a short war. So the question is not just a binary one of, can we all supply enough weapons for Ukraine to win it? It's how can you change the dial strategically over the long term so that defense capacity everywhere responds, if you like, to this new form of threat. And Ukraine is able to be armed, not just to push back, but also to change the equation in terms of how Russia might think about any future threat. Yeah. I know that's long term, because at the moment, no question, we all know Ukraine is engaged in an existential um, fight. But we must look at these two things together, not just what you need today or what you needed yesterday, but how what we provide now may help change the equation for the way in which Ukraine can defend itself in the future. It will get back to post-war world uh, yeah. a bit further, but uh, right now I want to ask you about uh, the attitude about this war in the British society and actually do the ordinary, the usual citizen, uh, citizens of the UK somehow link their uh, cost of living crisis with this war and maybe probably with some sanctions uh, against the Russian Federation, somehow may this influence actually the, the stance, the position of the UK towards this war? You know, it's a really good question. And uh, I think that they don't. That doesn't mean that all of these issues aren't on their minds. The UK public, UK citizens, are perfectly capable of feeling very strongly that the UK is doing the right thing mm -hmm. by helping mm -hmm. Ukraine to win this war. And those, the polling on those has been consistent all the way through. A high percentage uh, of British citizens think that the government is doing the right thing by helping to arm Ukraine. But it's equally uh, possible, and it is the case, that the majority of UK citizens feel concerned about the cost of living. They are concerned about the cost of energy. And this is like a perfect storm of COVID, cost of food, etc., and then the energy pressure that comes about over a winter that enables people to think both things. Yes, we think we're doing the right thing in Ukraine, and we are really worried and want the government to take measures on these things. I don't believe that they equate it in the sense of blaming Ukraine for these pressures. Many may know... Maybe that, they that, blame their own government? Maybe they... Well, I'm sure they do. Everybody, everybody does. <laughs> Everyone blames You look to government. your own government yes. to come up with solutions. But I think many people understand that uh, uh, Russia uses several weapons in this fight. They fight militarily, they fight by withholding and stealing food, and now they fight by withholding energy, and many people understand, and they fight with disinformation, of course. Many people understand that these are weapons. So that, for me, the important thing is, if the support is there to continue the fight, the onus is on all governments, not just the British government, not just to have plans, which the British government is doing, is developing, to assist those most vulnerable as we go through the winter in the UK, but also to make really clear how the help that the UK is giving Ukraine uh, is having an effect, which of course they are also doing. So far, do you see any Ukraine fatigue in the British uh, society in particular? Well, as a, the polling shows, I think, tells the tale. The support continues to be very high. What you do see, kind of almost automatically, because these days attention for any story is not going to last all the way through a year, you do see that Ukraine doesn't make front page news. Uh, does not as regularly as it used to. It still does sometimes, but in the first phase... When of something invasion, big happens. Exactly, or there's some big shift. Um, but in the first phase, it was on the front page of newspapers and it was in the TV news every day. And this has changed now. In February, March, right? A bit later, March, April time. My, is when March, April, okay. Uh -huh. But it hasn't disappeared. Mm -hmm. It's still there. So I think coming from up here, it's now sort of down here, mm -hmm. but it's not rock bottom. And if there were shifts, you could see that this leaps up quite, uh, quite quickly. So I'm not sure I would call it fatigue, but I do think that we all, uh, those of us who are concerned 150% 24-7 with this uh, invasion, have a job to do to make sure that that awareness continues. And it's incredibly important we do, because we can see 
how Russia continues to pump out the most extraordinary fake news, like daily, about every aspect of its, uh, of its invasion and every aspect of Ukraine's defense. So it's not something that we can sit back and say, you know what, come back to it. You can't come back to it. Why do we have to uh, help Ukraine to spend our money to help Ukraine? What would you answer? Uh, what answer would you give to an ordinary British citizen if he asked this question? Why do I have to spend my tax money to help Ukraine, a uh, quite a distant country, really? So, just a plain, quick answer. Well, first of all, it's not a distant country. It's a country in Europe, and UK is a European country. It is part of the European continent. So uh, it actually isn't as far away. Uh, and one of the things that happened in the first phase is that people understood that Ukraine was not far away. So that's the first thing. Secondly, it is about this assault on sovereignty and democracy. These are values that the UK, as people, mm -hmm. hold really dear. You can see it by the way in which, which British citizens have opened their homes to Ukrainian citizens and taken them in. About 117,000 Ukrainians have taken up that Homes for Ukraine scheme. And the more are there, the more of that awareness is there. And the third thing is that everyone understands that should Ukraine not prevail, the threat is not just going to stay with Ukraine. But still, the United Kingdom is far away from Russia. This is not Poland. This is not Slovakia. The United Kingdom has relationships with its European countries, and we think about our threats in the round, just as we, we think of, for example, supply of energy in the round. We think about global partnerships in the round, political issues in the round. We think about our security in the round. We would be... Uh, making a huge mistake if we didn't, obviously. So we think about what is out there that uh, is a threat for us and our European partners, uh, and we act together. These are the reasons why we spend our money in Ukraine. As for the Russian uh, energetic blackmail of the Europe, do you uh, think that it may somehow break or destroy this European unity about this war? May Russia somehow succeed in their blackmailing of Europe, energetic, economical, all this stuff. So uh, it's their next weapon, isn't it? As I said, there was military and then there's grain and we were threatened with famine and then we, there was able to be a deal which has got this going again and now our next challenge is energy. Um, again, what I think has been unprecedented is the way in which countries have come together to think about how they wean themselves off this dependence on Russian energy and some have more dependence than others. The UK is in a position where we are not dependent on Russian oil or Russian liquid gas. Lucky have, you are. Quite. We have a diversification, if you like, that makes it, uh, makes it easier for us. We are, though, ending any uh, further import of Russian oil by the end of this year. We are going to end the import of Russian liquid gas. But we do talk with our European partners about a broader strategy. You need, we will all need in the longer term, to be investing. Uh, in alternative sources of energy, nuclear, storing of hydrogen, and even actually emergency storing of gas if it comes to that, so that we can be more robust. If you like, it's been a bit of a wake-up call for us all, right? And like uh, some other areas that uh, I've often been uh, asked about, this is an area you could argue there are some countries that probably should have thought about this a while ago, but we are all now thinking about it. So as far as I see now, what there is is a good discussion between countries about how you do that how you wean yourself off this so that Russia cannot black, blackmail yourself anymore. And in the meantime, working together on emergency plans to ensure that the critical mass of energy needs are met by those countries so that Russia is going to have to find another weapon. What sanctions against uh, Russia should we wait in some, in, again, in some foreseeable future? And which of these sanctions are actually supported by the United Kingdom? In some, maybe, we are talking about some, okay, not weeks, but months. So uh, I'm not going to comment on future sanctions. What I can say is because, again, this is another conversation that um, uh, we should be holding on to, if you like, as much for security reasons as other, um, before, if you like, they're made public. But what we do know is the UK has, has uh, sanctioned about 1,100 people, about 120 entities, um, has the strongest sanctions regime now in the world. And we know that it is having uh, an effect. It's having an effect on Russia. And we know this in terms of their credit rating, and we know it in terms of the halving of their imports. We know it in terms of their brain drain. We know from open source that uh, much of their security industry, so defense manufacturing industry, has either stopped production altogether or has uh, halted some parts because they can't get everything that they need. So we can see in several areas, and these are just examples, so we can see in several areas it's ha having effect. So the role of our sanctions regime is to take stock each time to see where it's having effect, to identify gaps, 
and be talking, just as we do with military uh, assistance, to the Ukrainians about what we do about those gaps. We also know, as Putin said himself in March, there were problems and difficulties because of sanctions. That's what he said. Now we see that he is looking to other partners and other ways of circumventing them. So our next conversation for sanctions is we need to keep them strong because the longer we keep them strong, the longer Russia's GDP remains low, the longer we degrade their ability to be able to keep producing uh, defence uh, capability. Um, we need to understand then how those sanctions may be, if you like, uh, weakened by dint of having other partnerships and then see what measures we need to take. As you know, the uh, United Kingdom has uh, used to be seen as some sort of a safe haven uh, for the Russian oligarchs and, and big businessmen. Uh, right now, uh, actually, um, what sanctions against some Russian oligarchs may, Im may be imposed or are imposed right now? And uh, uh, so will this situation somehow change so that the London and the city will no more, will uh, any, any time more be some sort of a safe haven for, for the Russians actually, for the supporters of Putin's regime? So this is an area where, funnily enough, both candidates for prime minister, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, uh, have, uh, have fought. And they have both spoken very strongly and very clearly about this. And of course, Rishi Sunak led as, the, as our uh, finance minister, as our chancellor on the sanctions regime. Liz Truss herself has said several times, um, both that we need to be doubling down on sanctions against those who are enablers of Putin, whose money reaches, and not just money, but other assets reaches the UK. But she's also said that in previous years, we were probably slow to, to do that. So if you like, we've had our own catching up and we have caught up. So those 1,100 individuals, they include those individuals. And those individuals are subject to asset freezes and they are subject to travel bans. And then there are entities that are subject to transport bans. Russian airplanes can't land in the UK. Russian ships can't dock in UK ports. So we've caught up quite considerably. I really have a hope and I'm absolutely certain that both prime minister candidates have an intent that we do move away from a time where London and the broader UK was a safe haven for those illegal assets. How could, can we secure some uh, further isolation of uh, the Russian Federation, I mean, in, in the world, definitely, in the international terms? What should be done, for example, this uh, terrorist, uh, the, uh, the state that sponsors terrorism status? Do you support uh, imposing this status about Russia? So I think what is important about looking at these various ideas that are coming out of which there are many is to make sure that we trace it all the way to what the outcome is. And I think that there is a job to do for those who want Russia designated as a state sponsor of terrorism to make that outcome clear. For us, for the UK, the important thing alongside uh, sanctions is justice. How do we make sure that those who have perpetrated crimes against humanity and war crimes inside Ukraine potentially are brought to justice? And for that, for us, that lies with the International Criminal Court. That's why we are investing heavily in the capacity of the International Criminal Court. And we're also helping the Prosecutor General's Office to do that. That's where our effort is going at the moment. I think we would need to understand more clearly what legal impact other designations would have that would then strengthen the ability to be able to achieve that justice. So at the moment, I think it's a thing that is under review. Okay, let's get back to actually to the war that is currently going on. Uh, do you have any, some sort of forecasts or, or, or something about uh, how long may it take until we reach any sort of peace agreement? So... <laughs> I know this is a very no, difficult... No. no one got an answer, definitely. Well, I think that, I mean, I'm allergic to hypothetical assumptions about when, when anything may end, right? Not least because Ukrainians have defied the odds when back in the day when uh, some were predicting that this would end in three days, in a week, the uh, Russian special operation. By the way, why operation. did they predict that we're going to fall uh, in the course of 72, uh, 72 hours or 48 or something? Well, I think there were those who um, predicted it would happen um, because Russia said it would happen. So, but you have your own intelligence office. No, no, I mean, no. You, UK... be Let's be clear that the UK was not saying this is going to end in two or three days. Uh -huh. Russia was saying we're going to launch this special operation. It'll all be over in a week. And that was a piece of, um, uh, it was an assumption, if you like. Yeah, that was picked up by some. And, and, you know, the security kind of response was framed around that risk. So for some, it was a risk. And for others, it was a reality. But let me go back to my yeah. very first answer to your question, why Boris Johnson became involved. 
because he knew the threat was, was becoming a reality and he knew that Ukrainians would fight. So I'm afraid it's not the case that in the British government, we thought that this was all going to fall in two or three days. We always thought, and Liz Truss is on record as saying, that the biggest risk was that this was going to become a long, grinding war of attrition. And here we are. So in so, that sense... So far, this is already the war of attrition, isn't it? Yes, this is what it looks like. This is the thing that nobody wanted. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the mass uh, fatalities that we're seeing and the targeting of civilians is, uh, is so heart-rending an outcome that was foreseen before. But at the same time, uh, I, think it, I think it's wrong for any country to be suggesting when and how this war ends other than Ukraine. Mm -hmm. The only statement that I would say on it is that uh, the one thing that could end this now is if Russia stops its invasion. And here we've, uh, we've said this repeatedly. Russia withdraws its troops, goes back to its borders, and we're all, and it's, uh, and it's finished. Are you talking about the uh, 1991 borders? after the collapse of the Soviet Union. That has to be for Ukraine to decide. So as a minimum, I would say that you go back to the pre-February 24th where mm -hmm. you were okay. before. And then what happens after that, as I say, must be in the hands of the Ukrainian nation to decide. Uh, after the war, we uh, may somehow join NATO, maybe in some, in some quite distant future. But so far, we are mostly talking, I mean, our authorities are mostly talking about some security guarantees that may be provided by some big Western, and not only Western, even nations. So far, right now, we have even some sort of a, of a joint task team led by Andri Yermak and, and, and Andres von Rasmussen. Uh, so far, what security guarantees is the United Kingdom ready to provide to Ukraine? Well, let's see how that group comes out. We are awaiting the recommendations from that group, and we'll be interested in having the debate around what security guarantees up front can provide that would strengthen, if you like, those assurances. Where we are at at the moment is that the best guarantee is the uh, recalculation of the odds that Russia would make looking at a better equipped uh, better capacity, more ready Ukraine that basically makes it harder um, for them to consider invasion in the future. That is about having NATO standard troops, that's about troops being trained, that's about having the right amount of weaponry, that is about delineating the border clearly, and all these things are very doable things. So uh, I think it is up for debate, but it's an important debate, how security guarantees add to that, but they would have to add to that because in fact nothing really can replace a country achieving a degree of preparedness that means that an enemy country looks at it twice and thinks, you know what, maybe we won't. But so do you think that under current uh, Kremlin regime, this um, existential threat to the, to the world security, not only to the security of Ukraine, but also the Baltic states and actually to the whole world, may somehow be diminished? Or do we need any, any change of the political regime within Russia itself, or maybe some, the change of their political structure or, or, or their collapse at the Federation, who knows? Uh, do we need uh, these radical steps in order to be, to feel ourselves that uh, confident that we do not have this existential threat for the mankind anymore? Well, uh, I think two things uh, about that question. Firstly, that as it is for Ukraine to determine its future, it is for Russians to determine theirs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Russians have to decide. Do who you they think want Ru who Russians have the ability to decide? I think it is for Russians to decide, basically. And, uh, and I also think that it's hard to see in the Russian landscape uh, a person who may replace Putin Absolutely. who would immediately make uh, Ukrainians feel safer. So whatever you think about uh, regime change or political structures or the empowerment of the Russian people or any of that, what is clear is that any of that takes time. Whether Russian citizens decide for themselves that they want something different or not, it all takes time. So the, uh, I believe that we are, all of us, Ukrainians and neighboring countries, European countries uh, and others, must accept that we are looking at a long-term different threat trajectory mm -hmm. and that we all have to um, shift and change our policies accordingly, which is what our Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has said and why NATO has altered and increased its presence and its interest along uh, Ukraine's neighbouring countries, why we are training more with Baltic countries as the UK, for example, why we now have this really great joint training initiative um, from June of training Ukrainian troops. This is not just about Ukrainian uh, training, excuse me, Ukrainian troops 
For now, important though that is, it is also part of the longer term shift of posture that recognises that threat. Does the United Kingdom support a visa ban for the citizens of the United of, uh, of Russian Federation, which is widely debated? It right is now widely in, debated. In, in it's a very Europe. hot topic at the moment. And so what we have is our Nationality and Borders Act, which came into effect this year, actually. Uh, so it's a new thing. And it includes the provision for visa penalties. We haven't, so visa penalties, just to finish, on the basis of um, threats to peace and security. So we are keeping that under really close review in the context of this invasion at the moment. We have not moved at the moment. We are interested in how this debate goes forward. For now, we have named people who are subject to travel bans and want to see how that plays out. Unfortunately, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, prisoners of war uh, uh, captured by the Russians. In particular, there are some uh, British citizens among them and the people who call themselves uh, authorities of these lands. They uh, threaten even to, to, to have some, some trials or, or, or something and even to, to end all this stuff with a death penalty. Uh, can the civilized world, in particular the United Kingdom, do something about this situation, uh, about these atroc atrocities and all these uh, medieval-like looking threats in the 21st century, in particular about your citizens and our citizens, definitely? Well, those, uh, those trials concerning the foreign nationals are sham trials. Definitely. These people are not mercenaries, and those humanitarian workers are covered by international humanitarian law just as the fighters who were contracted to fight for the Ukrainian armed forces are not mercenaries are covered by the Geneva Convention. So the first thing is that Russian, and it is Russia, let's be clear, it's not the DNR or the LNR, we all know who's in control here, should be making sure that those people who are picked up and held as prisoners of war receive appropriate legal treatment as prisoners of war. And at the moment that's not happening and it needs to happen. So it is the UK's job, just as it is all countries who unfortunately may have foreign nationals who are being held to underline the importance of that law. If we don't keep making that clear uh, to uh, Russia, the law itself inherently gets weakened and we must make sure that we adhere to that. As for uh, what measures can be taken, as these, uh, these men are all contracted to fight for the Ukrainian armed forces, we work really closely and very regularly with the Ukrainian government to see how their release can be secured. But it is the Ukrainian armed forces and the Ukrainian uh, government's responsibility to be uh, doing those negotiations, both for Ukrainians who are prisoners of war and for foreign nationals who have been fighting alongside Ukrainians. Let's finish with an issue that we uh, used to talk a lot before the 24th of February. These are the reforms in Ukraine. Well, actually, our government, and maybe it is right in, in its decision, when it says that, okay, we have, we have some major issues, we have security issues, we have this massive invasion, so let's just somehow postpone the reforms and we'll get back to this issue, but, but, but after our victory. Do you think uh, this is a correct approach, in particular because of this war, as you've underlined, has already turned to a war of attrition and it may last for, for even years. So does this mean that all the reforms should be stopped in the course of this active phase of war? But I don't agree that reforms were stopped. I believe that in that first phase, when everyone was, was, if you like, coming to terms with what was happening and repelling occupation, I would agree that, that including all of us, were focused on other things. I mean, many of us were evacuated, for example. We were all focused on duty of care, one way or another. But government re resumed, and we, many of us, most of us now, President Zelensky said, I think, yesterday that 55 missions have resumed work now in, uh, in, in Kiev. We are uh, making sure that we support Ukraine on every level, and that includes building strong institutions, mm -hmm. and those reforms are inherent in that. And there has been some really good progress, even in the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. The appointing of those, in those two independents to the High Council of Judges, that came about as a result of the establishment of the Ethics Commission, which set up last year, with the legislation that went with it. This is an extraordinary moment because those reforms are long, they take a long time. I've said in previous interviews, my uh, successor will be working on these long after I've gone. But to see the progress at a time when a country is involved in this existential fight, this is as inspiring, if I can be really honest, mm -hmm. this is as inspiring to see the government bent on making sure that it grows a strong democratic country as it is to see Ukrainian fighters fighting. 
There is, though, one issue that I think has been set aside mistakenly, and that's not reforms. It is the issue of gender. And it will be a mistake, both in recovery and in justice, not to um, pay close attention to how women and girls are experiencing this war. In terms of justice, how those who are most vulnerable are subject to rape and sexual violence and need to Maybe see justice the war done. crimes, mainly. I, no, I don't just mean war crimes. Justice is part of that. But participation in economic recovery also requires us to think about how women are able to work, to earn, to look after children who are traumatized and have lacked education. And at the moment, I see that as a gap. But on the reform side, uh, I actually have been quite inspired. And I can see that European candidacy has probably helped to inject a sense of vigor into the reforms process. That can only be a good thing and we'll continue to support it. Thank you, let's finish with this optimistic vibe. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.